it's a delight, President DeYoung, to be here again on the Kelvin campus. I uh, came here first uh, right after my conversion. I was invited out here by Paul Henry, and we had a meeting with the uh, Calvin faculty, the undergraduate faculty, and I was, uh, at that time, I will confess a secret sin uh, that the evangelical world knew nothing about, and I hid carefully. This was only two years or three years after my conversion. I smoked. <laughs> Little did I know when I met with the Calvin faculty that I wouldn't be able to see across the room because they all brought out these <laughs> huge pipes. As a matter of fact, I told them that if I had really known that before I had joined a Baptist church, I would have become a Christian Reformed uh, <laughs> member. Well, the, those are the old days. But there are many reasons why I'm happy to be here. I really appreciate what Calvin is doing as an institution in the seminary and uh, thrilled with this conference uh, that you've honored me by asking me to come and address. I'm also happy to be in West Michigan for many reasons. There's very few places where uh, we've had so much support for the ministry from the very earliest days, and uh, two wonderful contributions to my ministry and my life made here in West Michigan. One of them, uh, President DeYoung mentioned, I'm working on a book on worldview, which I am. The last two years, I'm at that point that Churchill spoke about when he wrote a book, he'd say, at first you get very excited about it, then you can't wait to write, then you go through about the fifth or sixth draft, and then you're ready to throw the book out and get rid of it and give it to the world. And we're just about at that point, but my editor, who's been my editor since 1981, and lives here, and uh, we've worked together very closely over all of these years, Judith Markham. So Judith, stand up so they can reach you. <laughs> the other great contribution that uh, West Mich Michigan has made to the Ministry of Prison Fellowship is 10 years, almost 10 years ago now, I prevailed upon a member of our board of directors to come and to uh, be the president of the ministry and to be the CEO of Prison Fellowship. He left uh, the Herman Miller Company where he was a senior vice president, very successful with his family, comfortably ensconced here in this beautiful part of the world, and he came to that godless city of Washington, D.C. to run the ministry of Prison Fellowship. I don't think there's anybody in Christian service today doing a better job running a ministry than Tom Pratt, and Tom is back for this weekend. Tom, stand up so they can greet you as well, and his wife, Laura. And then, of course, what brings us together, the conference of Calvinists and Catholics coming together here, Grand Rapids, the bastion of the true Reformed faith, meeting on this campus on the eve of Reformation Sunday. Surely the millennium is coming. Surely something <laughs> extraordinary is happening. You can feel the ground shaking. But I, uh, I absolutely love it. I, uh, I will say that Father Sirico used some of his persuasive powers on me. Uh, I just admire his courage. I mean, first of all, can you imagine a Roman Catholic priest coming of all places to set up shop in Grand Rapids, Michigan? <laughs> and then to have the audacity to put on a conference like this with President DeYoung? I mean, I've always admired his courage, but you know, Aristotle said there's a golden mean, and the golden mean of courage is halfway between rashness on one side and uh, cowardice on the other, and I'm not sure about what Father Sirica doesn't lean a little bit towards the rashness side, but I, I really am thrilled with this conference. I think it is absolutely wonderful that you're doing this. As you all know, I'm sure, uh, since 1992, I've been involved in something called Evangelicals and Catholics Together. I have all the scars to show for it, and uh, been something of a controversial undertaking. That's an understatement, but uh, something I believe very deeply in, and I see this whole conference advancing that cause. And uh, interestingly enough tonight, I will draw my remarks uh, and have prepared my remarks, inspired greatly by uh, Abraham Kuyper, this being the 100th anniversary of his famous stone lectures at Princeton, and uh, Kuyper's influence being so profound on my life, I was introduced to him uh, by people here at Calvin, and uh, he's profoundly affected me. The other influence is John Paul II, who I think will, uh, I suspect my Catholic brethren here tonight would agree, will someday be known not as Pope John Paul II, but John Paul II, John Paul the Great, uh, one of the uh, most significant figures of the 20th century and influence that he's had and not only uh, on the church, of course, but on the world. So I'll be drawing my remarks on that tonight, and I plan to speak 
very plainly, because I know here in this part of the country you appreciate that, and I know I'm among friends and colleagues, and uh, many of you, and so I will get right to the point and, uh, and will speak as directly as I can. You always should do that, actually. My doctor at home told me of a patient who came to see him, a man who was a type A personality, a CEO of a large corporation, and when he arrived at my doctor's office, he was, he was shaken, shaking all over. And uh, his nerves were just gone. His high blood pressure was off the charts. He was in terrible shape. My doctor started to interview him and discovered that he'd been working 18-hour days and been flying all over the world and into all sorts of deals. And he realized this man was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. This man could have a nervous collapse. This man could die. So he told him, he said, you've got to go home and do absolutely nothing. I want you in bed rest. I'm going to put you on heavy medication. You forget about your, your business. You just go home and take it easy. You've got to take six months off to save your life. And as the man went out, the doctor thought, I'd better tell his wife the same thing. I'd better caution her. And so the doctor called the wife in and said, I've just told your husband that he has to go home and take six months, bed rest, do absolutely nothing. And I want you to do anything he says. Don't argue with him. Don't fight with him. If he wants breakfast in bed, give it to him. Wait on him. Do everything he asks for six months. Don't cross him once during that entire six-month period, or he could die. On the way home, uh, the husband was curious what the doctor had said. And so the husband turned to the wife and said, what did the doctor tell you? And she said, uh, he said, you're going to die. <laughs> this is a momentous time for the church as we reflect on 2,000 years since the birth of Christ and as we approach the millennium. And the question I suspect that all of us are asking and that the church should be asking across the board is the question the Jews asked of old after a time of great trial. And that was, how shall we then live? Or one translation, how shall we then survive? What should be the role of the church in the new millennium? What should be our outlook? I have to tell you as I travel around this country, I sense that there is a malaise, almost a despair, among many Christians, particularly evangelicals. We see things happening in our society that we simply can't rationalize. We can't explain them. Maybe it's fatigue over the culture war, and we seem to have lost a lot of battles that are very important to us. Or we see immorality in the White House. We see despicable behavior, and people seem to shrug their shoulders and say, well, we don't really care. We see courts taking over the rights of self-government. I know my friend Professor Russ Hittinger is here today, and I'm sure you've heard from him. You know uh, the magnificent scholarship that he has provided in the battle to keep the courts from taking over the right of self-government, and yet we see on almost every front where courts continue to do this. Most of the agenda of Christian conservatives, at least, in the last Congress was uh, not enacted. People came out of that with a great sense of frustration. You might have seen Katie Couric on television last week interviewing uh, the governor of Wyoming and uh, saying to the governor of Wyoming, do you suppose that all that rhetoric about gays that is being put out by Gary Bauer and Jim Dobson and other Christian groups caused the brutal killing of Matthew Shepard? And we begin to wonder uh, whether we're going to be blamed for everything in our society. Gallup polls showing that people are yearning for their own moral traditions, that they not be taken away. There's a temptation when people begin to feel this way, to turn away. And I sense this all over this country, where people are saying, well, let's go back and build our churches. Let's not worry about the culture. Let's turn away from the culture and forget about it and simply build the church and bring people in and minister to their spiritual needs and give them what they need to keep them fed spiritually. I encounter this everywhere. It's a new separatist fundamentalism. Safety of the sanctuary movement. Forget about the world. Nothing, nothing could be worse for the Christian church than to succumb at this time to that temptation. Number one, it's not biblical. Clearly, the scripture calls us to fulfill the cultural commission to subdue the earth to take every thought captive in obedience to Christ, uh, to care deeply about the culture around us. Pope John Paul, quoting uh, uh, Pope Paul VI, 
said that the separation of the gospel and the culture is the greatest tragedy of our time. You can't turn away from it. It's not, it's not biblical. Despair is a sin. We are above all a community of eschatological hope. We know how the final chapters of history are written. We have no business turning away in a sense of despair. And it couldn't possibly come at a worse time. It would be like an army fleeing from the field of battle just before it was to be victorious. Because I happen to agree with John Paul II when he says that this will be a springtime, the new millennium, in Redemptoris Missio, a wonderful encyclical when he talks about the new millennium being a springtime for Christian faith, that people are beginning to realize that all of the things on which we have banked our hopes in the 20th century, the false idols, are nothing but that. They're idols. They've fallen. When modern man has run the string out, he has said, I want autonomy more than anything else in the world. That's the ultimate virtue and has been for the last 35 to 40 years here in America. And people have finally achieved what they have wanted. Always be careful what you ask for, you may get it. People have finally achieved what they wanted, and they can't live with the chaos that results when their own kids are holding guns up to their head or shooting up schoolrooms. No, it's not biblical. Despair is a sin. Kuiper put it best. Kuiper said, the overriding principle of tomorrow's Reformation Sunday, the overriding principle of the Reformation was not soteriology. It was not justification by faith. The overriding principle of the Reformation was cosmological, that God is sovereign over all and that God's people are to care about every single aspect of life. He said it so well, dedicating free university, there is not one square inch of the universe as to which our Christ does not say, mine. And that's exactly right. And that has to be the battle cry for the church as we approach the new millennium. And the signs are good. Russ will tell you, and I hope he agrees with me on this, Russ Hittinger, that at least there was a good sign that the Supreme Court let stand an ordinance in the Cincinnati that uh, denied special privileges for homosexuals in that city, similar to the one that they struck down in Colorado or at least better, perhaps, than the one that was struck down in Colorado. Teenage pregnancies are down. Abortions are down. Abortions are down, I believe, as a direct consequence of the debate having been shifted to the question of life from the question of whether the Bible says. People are now facing the fact that that child in the birth canal whose skull is being crushed in a partial birth abortion is, in fact, a child. And so all of a sudden, we see abortions declining. Crime is down, not for the reasons you think. I'll come back and tell you in a moment why it is. Not for the reasons you think. And something is stirring in the moral debate. A year ago when I went on television and tried to make a point on a, one of those Washington talk shows about the fact that uh, private immorality has public consequences, I was laughed at. Can you imagine anybody in America today not saying that private immorality does indeed have public consequences. I think the moral debate is changing. The Holy Father said it in Redemptoris Missio beautifully, as the third millennium nears, God is preparing a great springtime for Christianity, and we can already see its first fruit, its first sign. In fact, in both the non-Christian and in the traditionally Christian world, people are drawing closer to the gospel ideas and values. I believe that's true. I think we Christians should approach the new millennium with a great sense of hope. And I want to tell you, as I go around the world and have gone from place to place, 600 prisons, I have seen the power of Christians living their faith to transform the culture in which we live. Eric Prince was with me last week, as a matter of fact, at a prison in Texas where we have taken it over. We've now run it for 18 months. It's extraordinary because it isn't just men coming to Christ and being redeemed, wonderful though that is, they've created a culture. I've seen it in a prison in Ecuador, Garcia Moreno Prison. I walked in one day, one of the most awful prisons I've ever been in anywhere in the world, where there was sewerage coming out on the floor. Where, As a matter of fact, we walked in the prison, there were two piles of garbage on either side of the door, and dogs were milling about, and there was blood on the step where they had brought men in. 
and we go into this detainee's wing where people can be held for five years without being told the charges against them. A cell for 12 people with four bunks. Uh, no running water. And when we got there, the, all the inmates were out in the yard, 400 inmates outside in the yard. And we got to the gate, and uh, I had 10 corrections officials with me from the United States and some of our supporters. And so uh, I wanted to take them in the yard and let them see what the prison was like. We'd been through the cells, the torture cells, old torture cells that were still uh, housing inmates. And uh, the guard stopped us and said to our interpreter, you can't go in that, that uh, compound where there were 400 inmates milling around. He said, it's too dangerous. Well, I'm the ex-Marine captain, and I brought all these people from the United States, so I've got to be bold. And I said, no, no, we want to go in. Tell him we want to go in. Secretly kind of hoping maybe he wouldn't let us in. Uh, and then I heard all this discussion going on, and I saw the guard say, see, and then I knew we were going to get in. Doors were flung open. One of my associates was with me, and uh, as I was walking through the door, he said, preach the gospel, and then I noticed him step back. Uh, <laughs> went into that yard. I've never seen anything like it. It's right out of a Dickens novel. It is the Middle Ages uh, revisited. Uh, men with eyes gouged out and stumps for their arms and shawls pulled around them. Women on both sides, or at least I thought they were women when I walked in, on the both sides, sitting on benches. They weren't, they were transvestites. Such depravity I could not imagine. And these men gathered around, and I was able to preach to them. And when I started talking about Jesus, you could see weeping in their eyes. And we left that place, we prayed, that in the middle of that dreadful pit of depravity. We left that place and walked no more than 100 yards where one of our leaders of our ministry in Ecuador had gotten permission to take over a wing of the prison. And it was like walking out of hell into heaven because we walked in and there were 300 inmates and they were sitting in their chairs and the back of the cell block was set up like an altar and they were singing and rejoicing and they had guitars and they saw us coming and they got up and came over and started to wrap their arms around us. It was the most exciting, thrilling thing. We've been running that wing of the prison just like we're running one in Texas. And you could see the entire culture transform. And there's a metaphor here. That is that if Christians live their faith and build their community and spread out from their communities and touch every area of life, we do begin to transform that culture. Not from our sanctuaries, but by getting out of our sanctuaries and living our faith in the world and advocating what we know to be true. How must we, what must we now do? How shall we now live? First of all, once again, Kuiper gives us the guidance. In talking about Christianity, he says we see it not simply as being saved. It doesn't stop with John 3.16. It is to see all of life in God's eyes. It is to see Christianity as a life system a world view. Precisely. You can't live rationally any other way. We were talking in the car about a, a question I got asked when I was giving a lecture on ethics at the Second Marine Division in Camp Lejeune, and a fellow asked me, is there, best question I've ever had, never had it on any of the college campuses, is there truth? <laughs> I love that question. Don't get asked it, unfortunately enough, on, on campuses because the faculty will discourage that because they believe there's no such thing. But if there is truth, then it's going to be reflected in the physical order of the universe and it is going to be reflected in the moral order of the universe because our God has created it that way. And so we have to see all of life from creation on as God has created it and then order our own lives accordingly because you can't live rationally otherwise. It's like walking into a dark room full of furniture and not turning on the light. You've got to know the moral rules that God has created in order to live a rational, responsible, sensible life. Neil Plantinger, who is here at the, at the Kelvin College, uh, wrote a wonderful little book, Sin is Folly, Foolishness. Because if you don't conform to the way God has created the world, you're going to be constantly cutting against the grain of the universe or as he puts it so graphically, spitting into the wind, or coloring outside the lines, and it's just foolish. 
And so Christians need a full understanding of God's physical and moral order so that we can order our own lives intelligently. We need it also for evangelism. If you walked into a room today of Christians and you said, Jesus is the answer, they would all nod, of course, as you're nodding. If there were any Baptists here, you'd say amen. I guess they know I'm the only Baptist in this place. But if you say Jesus is the answer, people would respond immediately. If you walk into a secular group today and say Jesus is the answer, they will look at you like you're just getting up an interplanetary trip. What do you mean Jesus is the answer? What's the question? Secular world doesn't ask any questions. The great questions that people have asked in the beginning of time, where have I come from, why am I here, what am I doing here, and where am I going, basis of most philosophical reflection through the centuries, is never asked. Nobody asks it. Nobody asks the great questions. And so in order to reach the world, we've got to have an informed view about what the world thinks and about how the world is structured exactly as the Apostle Paul did when he went to preach the gospel to the Greeks. It was one thing to preach it to the Jews. They understood all the presuppositions. When he went to preach to the Greeks, he had to be able to put it in their terms. Ah, I passed an altar to an unknown God. Or your poets have written. And eventually, once he engaged their culture and understood them and was able to bring himself to the point where they were able to follow him, then he told them about the resurrection. Francis Schaeffer called this cultural evangelism, absolutely crucial in our time. And if we're going to do this, if we're going to have a worldview, it's essential for us to understand the contours of it so that we can defend truth in the world. How else are we going to defend our positions if we don't understand it ourselves? And make no mistake, brothers and sisters, the battle today is a worldview against a worldview. Kuiper put it so wonderfully. If the battle is to be fought with honor and any hope of victory, principle must be engaged against principle. We cannot simply come and preach the gospel without understanding or defend what we believe without understanding that there are two wholly alien understandings of reality competing for the hearts and minds of civilized society today. One is absolutely relativistic. There is no truth. Everything's equal. You can believe anything you want. The other believes in absolute truth and a fixed moral and physical order. One is naturalistic and one is supernatural. Naturalistic says there's a naturalistic explanation of everything. I can explain how this podium was created. I can explain how this sound is being transmitted. I can explain everything about the universe by empirical evidence. I can show you all of that. The supernaturalist says, oh no, there's a spiritual realm that created it all. One is secular, that is of this age. One believes in the eternal. One is utterly pragmatic. Whatever works, do it. The other is utterly idealistic. One believes in history, we of all people as Christians are the people of the book of history, the God who is and who spoke and who is not silent and who's intervened in history and given us his son. Those are historical events. The resurrection is an historical event. But the modern world says, no, history is only the reflection of the people who write it, and it's only a subjective reaction at the moment, and so they deconstruct history. Boils down really to one thing. You know, I've, I've loved to read philosophy all my life and have, and uh, enjoyed it and uh, read many of the great tomes of going back to the Greeks, to Aristotle and Plato, and you'll find multi-volume works. Today, Americans have reduced everything down to a slogan. I mean, here we are, the USA Today generation, the McNugget generation. We've got it all down now to one word. See it on a bumper sticker going by. The zeitgeist of American culture, the spirit of the age in America today is in one word. Whatever. That's it. Great cartoon in the Wall Street Journal recently of a bride and groom, and the groom is standing there with his hand in his pocket, kind of slouched down, and the minister is saying, no, no, you're supposed to say, I do, not whatever. <laughs> the, other one I like, the other one I like that captures it all is, if it feels good, do it. And I have to tell you, a wonderfully re reformed pastor and good friend of mine who has a kind of an impish uh, way about him once in a while, his sense of humor gets carried away, 
came up behind one of those. Have you seen those bumper stickers on cars? You see them a lot. If it feels good, do it. Philip, my friend, came up behind him and uh, saw this car come to a stop ahead of him, and it had a bumper sticker. If it feels good, do it. So my friend stopped the car and then just pushed ahead and bang, hit the bumper. <laughs> Driver got out shaking his fist. What are you doing? And my friend said, feels good. <laughs> <laughs> You cannot defend truth if you do not know the two worldviews that are in collision. And Christians have to make an apologetic defense. This is my second point in response to what must we now do. We have to be able to show, lovingly, always give a reason for the hope which is within you, but with gentleness and reverence. Lovingly show the secular world why its presuppositions don't work. C.S. Lewis was a master at this. I love what he wrote about naturalism. The naturalist, if he really is logical about it, believes that we came from a chance collision of atoms and have mutated over the years through eight billion years to be what we are today. Came from two light rays coming down, refracting at a certain angle, the amino acid molecules split off, joined together, became one protein cell, and here we are, grown up germs, eight billion years later. But if that's true, the process by which we know that is a random process. How do you know that those molecules in your mind had to meet in such a way that they presented a logical, rational machine by which you can know that what you believe is true? You really can't know anything. Lewis put it wonderfully. In order to think, we must claim for our reasoning a validity which is not credible if our own thought is merely a function of our brain and our brains are a byproduct of irrational physical processes. I love to argue with people who say there is no supernatural, because within about 10 minutes, you've got them doubting whether they can believe anything. And that's exactly what the secular world has done to itself. It can't believe anything. It's made it impossible to, because its own presuppositions carried to the logical extreme make it impossible for them to believe anything. Second, Christians have a wonderful opportunity to answer the political dilemma that so many of us feel in this country. You know, I get really uptight when people come to me and say, I wish you Christians would stop trying to impose your values on us. And I love to give them just a little history lesson. Where did limited government come from? Limited government came from the belief that government was not all powerful and it, the divine rule of kings was broken in the Reformation by Calvin's argument that we live quorum Deo in the face of God and therefore government is not absolute, and by the Scottish cleric Samuel Rutherford's classic book, Lex Rex, the law is king, the king isn't law, the law is king, which shattered the idea of the divine rule of kings, and directly out of the Reformation came the basic principles of limited government and of the rule of law. And Kuiper does an absolutely brilliant job of explaining this in terms of the spheres of sovereignty. That is, government has a sphere, and family has a sphere, and intermediate structures have a sphere, and government is not absolute. Government's job is to make all these spheres work together under God. Limited government would not be possible were it not for the Christian influence. And when the people start saying, why don't you keep your Christianity out of politics? You wouldn't have democracy if we kept your Christianity out of politics. And then you hear the talk, well, the moral conservatives are fighting with the economic conservatives. What pure nonsense. Read some of Father Sirico's wonderful writings on this subject. Read Michael Novak, who was here this week. Was Michael Novak here today? One of my great heroes. Michael Novak writes about the three-legged stool. Western democracy is a three-legged stool. It has economic freedom, political freedom, and moral truth. Take away one of those legs, and the three-legged stool can't stand up. You need moral depth in order for economic and political freedom to flourish. Father Sirico writes about this brilliantly. There's no ethics without a transcendent basis of law. If there's no absolute right and wrong, how can you say this is what you ought to do? You can't. Ch challenge your secular friends. We all want ethical behavior because we don't want somebody ripping us off, but the only basis for an ethic system is if there are absolutes. There's no basis for law at all. Law is nothing except what nine black-robed justices who never got elected to anything say it is. 
unless there's some unwritten constitution or law above the law to which they are beholden. Christian has the only sustainable view of life. My good friend Robbie George, Russ Ittinger's good friend, many of us here in this room know him, Robbie George, young professor at Princeton, was given the task of debating Stanley Fish, who's probably the leading deconstructionist scholar in America. He's at Duke University, wrote the book, says there's no such thing as free speech and it's a good thing too. He believes there are no principles, all principles are preferences, and the object of intellectual discourse is to force your preference on somebody else before they can force theirs on you, which is the law of the jungle. And so Robbie George was given the task of debating the pro-life cause before the American Society of Political Scientists meeting Labor Day weekend in Boston against Stanley Fish. Robbie George is a Christian on the faculty at Princeton who has his degree in political philosophy from Oxford, his undergraduate, his undergraduate Swarthmore, his law degree from Harvard, and he's a brilliant man and a wonderful Christian brother. He wrote a piece, a brief, in which he argued that the child in the womb is a human being. He did not once say the Bible says, but he simply argued it on the basis of scientific evidence. They got to Boston, he was expecting a great debate with, Robbie, with uh, Stanley Fish from Duke, and instead Stanley Fish took the platform and he said, Professor George at Princeton was kind enough to send me his brief arguing that the child in the womb, that the, the baby in the womb, fetus in the womb is a child, is a human being. And he said, I read it, and before I give my response, I wanna say Professor George is correct. And I owe him an apology. Uh, because he has made the case, and science is on the side of the pro-life cause, not on the side of the pro-choice cause. 200 political scientists, chins, hit the floor at the same moment. <laughs> An incredible admission. He's being, he's being absolutely brutalized in the academic community, backing away from some of the things he said that day in Boston, but the record is quite clear. At least the case is made that if we, we have such a wonderful case as Christians and don't sit there saying, leave it to Robbie George or leave it to Chuck Colson or leave it to Russ Hittinger or leave it to these fellows who are doing this all day. Apologetics is over the backyard fence. It's over the barbecue grill. It is every single Christian informing their mind, thinking Christianly and being able to argue with their neighbors and to make persuasive the case of why Christianity is the only rational way in which we can look at the world because all other constructions of reality prove to be irrational. That's a case we have to make in our own sphere of influence. Second, we have to learn how to live as agents of common grace. Calvin and Kuiper make a wonderful distinction on the question of grace. So often we Christians think about grace as merely God's saving grace. And I know what that's like. 25 years ago in my friend's driveway, flooded tears, I surrendered my life to Christ. Nothing has been the same since. Nothing can ever be the same again. I know about salvation and saving grace. But Kuiper and Calvin make a wonderful distinction, and that is between saving grace, by which God comes down with his power and declares us righteous, and common grace by which God exercises his power in order to hold back the consequences of sin that would otherwise destroy the world. That means we as Christians are to be instruments of common grace, wherever God's called us. I see some wonderful people here tonight, old friends who have worked in the prisons for many, many years. They're instruments of common grace every time you go into that prison, Al, and share that love of God with those guys inside. You are an instrument of common grace, Bernie, every time you do that. You're an instrument of God's common grace. And whatever walk of life you're in, you've got to be that. I was, a number of years ago, out in Las Vegas at the National Religious Broadcasters. We had a prayer breakfast there. It's the only time I go to Las Vegas in to speak and fly out the same day, if humanly possible. I was there for a breakfast and sitting next to this young woman next to me, and she was a Hollywood scriptwriter. And I said, um, what are you working on? She said, well, I've got a great script idea. And she said, a great uh, storyline. And I'm going from studio to studio to sell it. And so she started to tell me what it was. And I said, boy, that's neat. I said, what got you to Hollywood? She said, I'm a Christian. And I believed I should be in Hollywood writing scripts. And she said, I'm going to get this on TV. And I looked at her and I thought, I am so glad there's somebody willing to do that. But somewhere along the line, someone's going to have to 
wake this poor woman up out of her dream because she's never going to succeed. And I turned to her and I said, I'm sure glad you got the perseverance to stick with it. She said, I'm going to stick with it until I get this script sold. That woman was Marion Williamson, touched by an angel, and that's now one of the leading programs on television. A Christian who just set out to do that. That's instruments of common grace. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, in our ministry, we believe in something called restorative justice. Uh, we were talking about that at dinner tonight with the Archbishop from uh, the Vatican, Antoine, about restorative justice. Justice ought to be to, to bring society back into balance, into the harmony of the shalom, what the Jew called the shalom, which we say peace, sort of glibly, but the Jew meant something much more. They meant that was the right way people lived together in harmony and concord. And so one of the things we're doing in prison fellowship is not only taking the gospel into the prisons, and not only working with these kids through Project Angel Tree, which I know many of you, I'm sure, in this room are involved in, but also going into the community and working with the victims of crime and working with the criminal justice system. Pat Nolan, who runs Justice Fellowship, is here this evening as well. And to work with the criminal justice system to try to bring and restore the harmony of that community that's been destroyed by crime. And I've been to a place called Allison Hill in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I went there as we were getting started working. And I saw what happened in Harrisburg. When I'd walked through the areas of the Spanish ghetto, uh, Hispanic ghetto, and saw uh, syringes on the ground, and saw spent rounds, and uh, saw the rundown buildings, and drug dealers out in the street making deals. And then we moved in and put up a storefront office and began to really work in that community of Harrisburg. Now you can walk through that area, and you won't find hypodermic needles. You won't find spent rounds, because the Christians came out of their churches and began to march through the streets, just like the Salvation Army did in East London 100 years ago. Began to march through the streets having parades and calling people out, and they would get the drug dealers blowing their horns and trying to disrupt them. It made no difference. They kept right on going. The prostitutes would come out. They would pray with them. Many of them were led to Christ. They'd follow along behind. They have cleaned up that area because they have restored their community. The answer to crime is not to put people in prison. The answer to crime is to restore the lost harmony in the community. And now sociologists are writing papers about the broken window syndrome because the New York police chief figured out if you went in and you cleaned up an area, all of a sudden crime started to drop. Rudy Giuliani looks like the, the best politician in America because he's got the crime rate in New York down precipitously. But it's not because he discovered something new. He discovered an ancient Christian truth. Augustine called it the tranquilitas ordinus, the tranquil order. And that's what restorative justice is, to get the tranquil order restored to that community. And then crime begins to decline. How do you do that? People get involved in their own communities, in their own community life, and go out and be instruments of common grace in that community. And that begins to change it. Fourth, finally, what we must do, have a biblically informed worldview, understand it so that we can defend it, and then, of course, live and be able to, to rationally defend it, and then be able to live it out, and finally, and most important of all, is to bring the church together as Jesus commanded us to be, to be the people of God. And that's why this conference is so valuable. We've simply got to learn how to stand together as mere Christians. I love, thank you. Thank you. I love what C.S. Lewis entitled his book, the book that was so influential in my conversion to Christ, Mere Christianity. Take the basics of our faith and begin to take our common stand. Six, seven years ago now, Father Richard Newhouse and I were in a meeting of evangelical and Catholic leaders in New York, and I felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit in a way that I never had quite before. I felt like I wanted to reach across the table and tell these brothers that I love them. We began to meet afterwards, and could we say some things together instead of fighting out in the mission field? Can we say some things together in defense of a biblical worldview? This is why a worldview is so important, because it gives us that common basis on which we can come together and agree that we stand united in truth 
not in, not in, in, in service of the truth, not in compromise of the truth. We worked for a long time and came up with a document called Evangelicals and Catholics Together. Made front page news because we released it Easter week and everybody thought that it was finally the end of the Reformation and the split in the churches of course it was no such thing. It was 25 people in New York agreeing to sign something as individuals speaking from and to their community. But it nonetheless created great stirs throughout the Christian world, needless to say. The worldview was the key. What I'm talking about tonight, and Kuiper was the one who understood this better than anyone. Here we are on the Calvin campus. I have to tell you what Kuiper said about evangelicals and Catholics together in his day. By this unity of conception alone given in Calvinism, that is a worldview, we may once again be able to stand side by side of Romanism in opposition to modern pantheism. What Kuiper was saying 100 years ago is that Christians have to come together and defend their worldview. Precisely what evangelicals and Catholics together was all about. Precisely what this conference is about. And then listen to what else Kuiper said. You'll notice on the Calvin campus I bring my Bible and Calvin's uh, and Kuiper's lectures at Princeton in 1898, the famous Stone lectures. But they're absolutely wonderful. If you haven't read them, you must. I was introduced to them by Evan Runner. Listen to this. A so-called Orthodox Protestant need only mark in his confession and catechism such doctrines of religion and morals as are not subject to controversy between Rome and ourselves, the leading Calvinist spokesman, Kuiper, not subject to controversy between Rome and ourselves, to perceive immediately that what we have in common with Rome, such concerns that are precisely those fundamentals of our Christian creed now most fiercely assaulted by the modern spirit. In this conflict, that is of worldviews in conflict a century ago, as just they are today. Rome is not an antagonist, but stands on our side, inasmuch as she also recognizes and maintains the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the cross as an atoning sacrifice, the scriptures of the word of God, and the Ten Commandments as a divinely imposed rule of life. Therefore, let me ask, if Roman Catholic theologians take up the sword to do valiant and skillful battle against the same tendency that we ourselves mean to fight to the death, is it not the part of wisdom to accept their valuable help. help. ECT, Evangelicals and Catholics Together, which created such controversy, was launched actually by Kuiper's argument a century ago. Not new at all. In the second document we produced called ECT 2, The Gift of Salvation, we affirmed that we are justified by faith alone. An extraordinary document for it to be signed by both Catholic and Protestant theologians and activists across, working across the table. We thought we'd done something very new, but we hadn't, as I'm sure President de Young knows. 1541, there was a Catholic cardinal by the name of Caterini who called together a group in Regensburg. And Luther couldn't go because Luther couldn't travel through Germany because he would have been killed. So he sent two aides. Melanchthon and Bucer, to negotiate with the Roman Catholics over the principles that had divided the two since the Reformation began, with Luther nailing the 95 Theses to the door at Wittenberg. Bucer took with him a bright young reformer, whose name happened to be John Calvin. And at the conferences at Regenberg, they came to an agreement on justification by faith. So much so that Luther, that Calvin then wrote a letter to Farrell saying, you won't believe this, but we drew up a formula on which corrections were accepted by both sides. You will be astonished, I am sure, that our opponents have yielded so much when you read the extracted copy as it stood when the last correction was made upon it, which you'll find enclosed in our letter. They came to an agreement no different than we have agreed to, which has created such controversy in Christian ranks over the last two years. 450 years later to get back to where they were at Regensburg. But the time has come that we begin to take seriously what our Lord prayed in the high priestly prayer the night before he was crucified. Father, may they be one with one another as I am one with you in order that the world will know that thou didst send me. 
the best formulated worldviews, the best evangelistic campaigns, the best things we can do as Christians will be for naught if the world can't see that the people of God stand together. The scandal ought to be not the scandal of division, but the scandal of the cross that the Son of God went and died and shed his blood for each one of us. Thank God for the courage of those who put this conference on. I deeply appreciate it and uh, am honored to be here for this closing message. Where does this lead us? How then shall we live? My friend Father Newhouse says that uh, he's not an optimist because optimist is a matter of optics. But he has hope, and I have hope. And when I first read Redemptoris Missio, I thought to myself, this is not the work of an old man, because as you get older, you tend to be kind of more negative and more skeptical about what future generations will say. But when I read about springtime of hope for the Christian in the new millennium, and as I began to reflect on it, I realized that John Paul II was absolutely right, that the view of the new millennium that he has presented to the world is correct that this next century will be, as Michael Novak recently wrote in the New York Times, the Christian century. And the reason for that is very simple. Look at what has happened in the history of this century alone. Starting out with the triumphalism early in this century, captured brilliantly in the film Titanic. If you've seen the film Titanic, I won't ask you to raise your hands because our pastor says, in my church, with a nude scene in it, no Christian should go see it, but I saw it on an airplane, the edited version, so I'm okay. <laughs> but there's a great moment in that film, worth the film. You can leave when the nude scene comes on, but it's worth seeing this. At the very beginning, one of the passengers is getting on the Titanic and looks up at this mammoth ship, this Tower of Babel in the 20th century, and says, there is a ship that even God himself couldn't sink. <laughs> Never got halfway across the Atlantic. And when you watch that movie, you see the triumphalism, the post-Edwardian triumphalism absolutely failed, bankrupt. And then you look at the influence of Freud and Dewey on education and Freud on therapy, that we, we could find the best in people by bringing it out in themselves. And the disaster that that has created, the utter failure, the utter bankruptcy. Look at humanism, man is the center of the universe. Look what that has produced. Look at the Hegelian or the, the Darwinian, Darwinian notion that we're constantly getting better as we get better educated, we will live more rational and civil lives. Tell that to the survivors of Auschwitz. Tell that to the people who came out of Cambodia with the killing fields and running red with blood. Now, knowledge didn't change anything. This is the bloodiest century in human history. National socialism was to deliver the people from its oppressors. Ended up in the greatest catastrophe of modern times. Marxism, liberate the workers, throw off their chains, enslaved two-thirds of the world at one time. Scientism, we will answer all the questions with science. Look at all the pretensions, the utopian pretensions of the 20th century, every single one of them. Existentialism will set you free. The sexual revolution will liberate you. Liberate you, it put people in in their coffins, destroyed the families. No, every single proposal, every single utopian idea of the 20th century has been utterly discredited, and postmodern man is standing now naked, looking for somewhere where there's truth. You can't live with the chaos that results. And the Pope has correctly understood that it's a springtime of Christian harvest because if we Christians will present to the world the image of the living Christ and his love and a loving community, if we'll stand together and lock arms and stand on common ground, that this is an hour in which Christianity is once again seen as the only rational way to organize your life. God's revelation is the only hope for living a rational life. Everything else has failed, and this is the Christian moment. The new millennium is the springtime of harvest. It is no time to turn away. It is no time to say that this is not our Christian duty to go out and to live the gospel. It is a time to do exactly as Kuiper told us to do 100 years ago, and that is to have a fully formed worldview, principle arrayed against principle, and in the springtime 
of hope that the new millennium gives us. This will be once again a time when people will turn away from all of the broken false idols of this century and turn to the one true hope, the revelation of God in Christ and the gospel, the good news, which brings salvation and hope to every single human being. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.